Hi everyone, I just want to um, talk about my Entity Controller component and go through some examples of how you can configure it and how you can you know, set it up for your Home Assistant instance. Um, this component it started off as a simple motion lighting controller, but it's since evolved into a more a generic controller. So let's have a look at the documentation and I will go through each example um, just to explain it in a video to help people understand it. An entity controller is in one of many different states at any time. Most of the time it will be in idle state and basically it's just observing what is happening and nothing else. Um, it's just observing, you know, waiting for motion sensor input and um, that's all it's doing really. Active is just an implementation detail really. You don't have to worry about it much. Active timer means it has uh, turned on your control entities and it's um, just waiting for the timer to expire. Active stay on. This is for the stay on feature. Someone requested this and they wanted the um, entity control to just stay on when the timer expires. So rather than turning off all control entities, the uh, controller will just leave them on and go back into idle state. Overridden. If you define what's called an override entity, um, and this override entity is switched on, it could be you know just a toggle button in your in your Lovelace configuration here. If that's turned on, your entity controller will go into overridden state, and it won't do it won't act on sensor input basically. Blocked is um, is a little bit different in that if if one of your control entities is already switched on, right? If a light is already on, and you get a motion sensor is triggering, in that case, entity controller will go into blocked state. And the reason behind this is because um, if your light is already on, the problem of lighting has been taken care of. There's no need for entity controller to do anything about it because the light is already on. So in that case, it will simply go into blocked state. Constrained is uh, you can define start and end times and entity controller will only operate during those times. So I've sort of talked about this a bit, but basically you've got different types of entities that entity controller will interact with. So you've got your control entities. These are the entities you want to turn on and off in the most basic way. Sensor entities is what's providing the input to entity controller. Remember, so entity controller at its core is a uh, when this happens, then do this for some amount of time. <laughs> That's all it is at its core, but it's doing it in a in a way that makes it really reusable and really easy to configure. If you had to implement this using conventional home assistant automations, it, you would kind of pull your hair out, and it would be a lot more difficult to maintain and state entities um, don't worry about state entities in a for now in a perfect world state entities and control entities are the same thing um, I will touch on this a bit more later on override entities I've already mentioned them okay let's have a look at a basic configuration and it really is basic so you've got a sensor something to control and a delay of five minutes and how this works is um, sensor here, you will trigger it, it will turn on momentarily and entity control will be on for five seconds and then it will turn off and it will also um, control your table lamp in this case. And that's all it will do in this scenario. And it's very easy to configure. Now you can, okay, to explain blocked state but basically what happens, so let's turn on this control entity, trigger motion, and you'll see the controller goes into blocked state. And that's because, um, you know, the lamp is already on, entity controller doesn't have to do anything in, in this scenario. So this is to prevent interference. For example, maybe you have some other automation. Maybe you've got an automation that turns on every day at sunset and it will turn on your um, all the lights in your house. Okay, In that scenario, you don't want Entity Controller to come on, um, take over control of all your entities, 
or your lights and then turn them off five minutes later. You don't want it to interfere in that way. So that's why I've implemented blocked state to prevent this. Now time constraints is, is pretty simple. So that's where the constraint state comes from. You give it a start and end time. Um, you can also make it relative to sunsets. And this is obviously really useful. Stay on. So this is a feature. It's quite simple really. When you when your motion is triggered, it will turn on your control entities, but it won't turn them off afterwards. So it will stay on indefinitely until you until you manually turn it off or until some other automation kicks in to turn it off for you, really. Overrides, that's the um, demo here. So you've got overrides defined down here. You can use multiple entities, and if those entities are in an on state, it will not touch your control entities. So you see it here. We turn on this override switch, and we trigger motion. And because it's in the overridden state, it will not react to sensors. It won't react to sensors at all. Now, custom call service call parameters. This is really useful. Basically, what entity control does, it's simply calling the turn on and turn off um, call, service calls on your entities. Now, sometimes you may want to supply custom service data. And um, so I'm using this because I've got some MQTT lights, some LED strips, and I can pass in service data to control the brightness. Night mode. So night mode just allows you to pass in slightly different parameters on a different schedule. So your entity controller is active because it's within active hours, but sometime later from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. you wanted to use different parameters because you don't want to be, you, you, you know, you might want to put it at 20% brightness during the night because you don't want to be blinded when you, um, you know, walk around the house at night. Sensor types, so different types of motion sensors. Basically, there's two types. First one is instantaneous events. All it does, it says, it sends a, uh, all your motion sensor does, it says, hey, there's motion. And that's it. It, it won't notify you when the motion stops, right? The second type of motion sensor, it will process the data a bit and it has some built-in uh, delay, right? So it will detect motion, it will tell you, hey, there's motion, and then it, it will sort of keep, it, the state will be on for some time, and then after some time, once the motion sensor uh, detects no motion, it will send an off signal. In my opinion, this first type of motion sensor is more useful because it's giving you raw data. Motion is instantaneous, right? There's either there's motion at any given point in time or there's no motion at any given point in time. So if you've got one of these, one of the um, duration sensor type motion sensors, um, all you have to do is uh, provide this configuration, this uh, value here, sensor type duration, and you should be good to go. So to explain the difference, normal sensor, it will turn on and the sensor will turn off immediately, right? And that's because they, um, well, that's because it's an instantaneous event. There's no state, it's not stateful. The only reason it's turning on here is to cause a state transition in home assistant, right? That's actually why I wrote the script here. All it does when you click it, it will turn on this binary sensor here and a few seconds later, we turn it off to simulate event-based motion sensors, I guess. And that's the duration sensors here. So you see, we're directly controlling this entity. We're leaving it on for some time. Motion is on, it's reporting as motion, this motion. And you see here, it will expire when the sensor turns off, right? And that's what duration sensors will do. Entity controller will wait until your duration sensor is off. Right? So either it will wait until the duration sensor is off, or it will turn off your control entities when the timer expires. Whatever, whatever, happens, um, whatever happens first or last, I don't remember. Now sensor resets timer. Um, yeah, so basically 
given that scenario here, your motion sensor is on, but when your sensor resets, it will once again trigger your timer. It will reset your timer, and after an additional five seconds, it will turn off your control entities. So you've got a timer started, a timer will expire, but your sensor is still on. So when your sensor will turn off, it will restart your timer, and it will, um, you know, when it expires, it will go into idle state, right? That's just saying you've got these entities here, um, with those icons and stuff. Now, there's some advanced configurations. For example, you've got exponential back off. If you provide this back off option, um, what it will do every time your motion is triggered or your sensor is triggered, it will increase this delay here. So, on the second time, the trigger, you know, it's increasing every time. This example, um, I think it's multiplying by 1.5, so the back off factor is 1.5. Yeah, um, but you can you can set this too. You can make it 1.1. What all it means is, as the number of triggers increases, your delay will increase much slower. Whereas if you multiply it by 1.5 or by 1. Point, or even by 2, every time it will increase by a factor of 2 and it will reset each time. So this is useful if you don't, if there's like a really high traffic area in your house and you, and you don't want the, um, and maybe like the 30 second delay is way too small because you still get lots of traffic and you know, using exponential back off is a way to, I guess, reduce the noise or make your, make your system less sensitive to this motion because it will take longer to reset. Calling custom scripts, this is a really useful one because um, rather than using control entities, you can actually call custom scripts. And these scripts that you define can do, you know, they can do anything. All, all that um, entity controller will do is turn these scripts on and start running them. The use case here, what I'm using it for is LED strips. Talk more time restriction. Somebody, I think somebody just uh, contributed this or asked for, asked for this feature. It's putting a limit on the amount of time your controller can be in blocked state. So if you remember from before, if a control entity is on and at the same time your motion is triggered, your controller will go into a blocked state. Right? So that's normal. And it will not come out of this state until your control entity is switched off. Right? So I think the use case for block timeout was what if you forget or what if you're not able to turn off your control entity manually. Let's wait for this to reset. Yep, we'll turn this on. We'll trigger motion. It will go into blocked state. But you see down here, right? It will only stay in the state for five seconds. After five seconds it will go back into idle and it will turn off this control entity. And, okay, in this example, because your delay and your block timeout is the same, it doesn't really make sense. In a real scenario, you probably want your block timeout to be um, a value of something like 30 minutes or 10 minutes, something that's much longer than your delay, or even hours. It doesn't really make sense to have it the same value as your delay, because then it's not really doing any different. Yep, so you just provide this, and um, that's how you implement this. State entities... I always struggle to explain this, but in a normal scenario, control entities and state entities are the same thing. Entity controller, so it's particularly for block scenario, it's observing the state of this lamp here. But what if your control entity is something that doesn't have a useful state, right? So what if your control entity is a scene? And scenes are always in scening state. So I'll just find they're always in this weird scening state, and that it never never change. So you use state entities to observe uh, and to observe something that actually has a useful state for entity controller to use. So in this case, here I've got a script and I've got a light, and because the script doesn't return a useful state, I've overridden this, and I'll have the controller look at the light only. A different example here is cooking, uh, is uh, scenes. I've got this cooking scene here, 
basically I've got this template sensor. If that will turn, if that turns on, uh, entity controller will activate the scene. Um, but it needs to observe something within the scene. So probably this thing here, this LED strip, is part of the cooking scene. A cooking scene will turn on the kitchen LED strip. Now somebody did really good work here, implemented service calls on the controller instance itself. So you can go into, um, you can actually call these services on your entity controller instances. If you call, um, I've never actually used them, but if you call these, you can set these parameters. You can clear block state using another automation. You can set, you can activate night mode too. So that would, that's really useful. And we will, you know, build this out a bit more, add more service calls, um, different, so more support for service calls. This is just the beginning. So it's really good stuff here. Okay, somebody implemented this. They wanted a way, uh, okay, so by default, any change to your control entity state will count as a manual change. And that means it will enter blocked state, okay? Um, so in certain cases, you want to ignore these changes. For example, if you're using the flux compo component or circadian lighting component, these components they continuously change the state of your of your life, and you don't want entity controller to react to those changes. At these uh, this field here, and it will ignore brightness and color temperature, and that's how to how to use entity controller alongside one of these components here. For debugging, if you've got any issues, make sure you first enable debugging logs, see if there's any error messages. It will also print out the entire configuration for your entity controllers, um, which can be useful. Down here I've got some links to some research, some blog posts I've done, how I came up with entity controller, um, how I came up with the requirements for entity controller, and, some, uh, and here's a guide for how to set up stateless motion binary sensors in Home Assistant.